And um, we want to talk about um, some of the things that, um, that we, we, we face in life. Father, open your words to our hearts. And uh, we just declare, Lord, that this is the day the Lord hath made, and your word is there for us to give us strength and help. Bless it now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Houston, we have a problem. Where did that saying come from? Originally a genuine report of life, life-threatening fault, now used humorously to report any kind of problem. The origin, Houston, we have a problem, is right up there with Beam Me Up, Scotty. <laughs> uh, and at the top of the space flight related quotation tree. In fact, both are slight misquotations. Mis uh, John Swigger Jr. and James Lovell, who, with Fred Hayes Jr., made up the crew of the U.S. Apollo 13 moon flight, reported a problem back to the base in Houston on the 14th of April in 1970. Houston, we have a problem, is often credited with the project's leader, Lovell. Actually, not only did Lovell not say the phrase, he wasn't even the first to not say it. Uh, if you see what I mean. Swaggart and Lovell almost used the phrase to report a technical pro uh, fault of the electrical system of one of the service modules oxygen tanks. Swigger? Okay, Houston, we had a problem here. Houston, this is Houston. Say again, please. Lovell, Houston, we had a problem. We've had a main B bus undervolt. This is Apollo 13. Houston, we have a problem, was later used as a tagline in 1995 as the, in the film of uh, Apollo 13. It is the dialogue of the film edited for dramatic effects that now best is best remembered. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Houston. Huh? Say again, please. Houston, we have a, pro have a problem. We have a main B bus, a bus B undergold. The issue of the film brought about a renewal of the use of the line and from then on onwards and upwards. It began to be used in non, non space flight context. The first example of such I can find the, the author says is the title of a non too favorable review of the Los Angeles Times, July 1995, of a restaurant called Houston's. Houston's, we have a problem, it said in the review. Houston's is yet another slick corporate package, the antithesis of mom and pop restaurants. The phrase was used again in 2001 to report the health, of, health and addiction problems of singer Whitney Houston. More recently still, it has been called out of retirement as we, we have a problem. We have a problem. We, W-I-I, we have a problem. Uh, for use in the stories about the injuries caused by over-enthusiastic use of the Nintendo game console. We have a problem. The past, this past week, there's been lots happening with this, uh, the, you've probably seen about Pokemon and people running all over the country, up and down and around and about, new churches and graveyards and people getting robbed and everything. And so, of course, on Facebook there was a, an article that uh, I was just about to forward it on, and it talked about the, the young fellow from Japan that uh, created Pokemon and how he grew up in a Christian home and how he didn't want to serve the Lord, so uh, he set out to create a game that was anti-Christianity. And it went on to say that he, he tried to prove that, uh, that Christianity, you didn't need it, he believed in atheism and he believed in, in uh, all things, the good things that the world is losing out with. And uh, so he, he, he made a point of it to try and make it. And so he just thought like, wow, this, you can see how it's growing and how it's expanding and it's going crazy right now. Uh, they jammed the systems of their downloads when it came in. I mean, that's almost as bad as last night at midnight. Uh, the Harry Potter book was put available on market at midnight. Hasn't had one for years. And, and people are just fascinated. I mean, lined up, waiting, uh, opening stores at midnight to get in to get the Harry Potter. It's all a hype. It's all a, it's all a setup. You know, it's just like you just... Uh, so now you're going to think that I set up the, the, the farm, the, my, my, my grad show. <laughs> Get everybody all excited about it for another week. Problem was, the only people I advertised it to was the people that dropped in. I had to go around making anything up. And, you know, when the, something just isn't working, I just go like, like um, maybe there's a, a reason. Maybe there's, and so, so this isn't really wasn't to, to hype it up and get everybody chomping at the bit to show up. Uh, but you see, 
when I looked at this article about, about the Pokemon, and, uh, and then I thought, well, before I forwarded that one on, and I've learned years ago, check it out. So I checked it out with Snopes, and Snopes said, well, that article was written 10, 12 years ago. It was supposed to be an interview with Time Magazine, and uh, th that this guy say back and forth what he's doing. And there is actually an interview with Time, but it didn't say that. And, um, and so I just said, uh, my friend had posted, so I posted back and said, well, Snopes, you better check out Snopes. There is, there is some problems there because people are walking down the streets into things because they're watching their computers. And, and there is a problem that we're, uh, you know, there are some problems there, but he did not go out to create this to over overcome Christianity. Anyways, so I, 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 I put that, I sent that to my friends, and someone says, well, so now you're believing in Snopes more than truth. And someone else said, you know, like, I just laugh when people think slopes are, you know, <laughs> are accurate. And, um, and, I, and so then they're, they're mocking me, telling them to look out. And uh, so then I wrote back and said, you know, I did, I did went down this road once. I've been down it a couple of times. If, you know, if you're the kind of person that never, never, ever says anything, you just keep everything inside and you build it up and think it through. And down the road, uh, you know, like... Um, down the road you see that it wasn't really true, then, then you haven't risked anything. But if you're a Peter type personality that's out there, you got something, you gotta share it. You know, like you want and, and uh, when when I was growing up, my uncle and my grandpa talked about Greggy's Greggy's call in life. Greggy's call in life. They called me the town crier. You know the town crier did in the old in the old days? They went out and spread the news. And they said, he, Greg, he's the town crier. And I guess I've always been like that. Uh, that's why I've given away thousands of videos, thousands of videos. And before that was cassettes. I've given away books. Uh, when, it, when, when the shack came out, I bought probably 30 or 40 copies of the book and, and, and gave them out to people, different ones. And, and there's just, I've, I've always been like that. But sometimes when you get out there too soon, you need to check out. So I did some other research and on Charisma Magazine and, and different other notable researching. Because I had already typed out what I was going to say with this because I thought, yeah, this is good. We better send this out. And, um, and then I found out it wasn't true. So I just said, well, when these people started to make fun of me, I said, well, you know, um, I learned my lesson many years ago. And you have heard the story. When this singing group from California was up in Dauphin, Manitoba, and they shared with me how one of their friends was watching TV, and the owner of McDonald's shared on TV that he gave 20% of his, he's not like Christians giving 10%, he gave 20% of his profits to the Church of Satan. And I loved McDonald's at that time, because it was just starting out, we had to go to Brandon or, or Yorkton to get to McDonald's. And so I just thought, oh my goodness, you can see why they're prospering, because the devil's behind this, and so I told my congregation, you better start boycotting McDonald's. Because you know what I was told, and we know for a fact, because this guy saw, he has a friend that saw it on a friend on TV. And now Facebook, yeah, not Facebook, the internet is way worse because stuff, you can, you can make pictures that aren't real. Uh, it's amazing. And every so often, with all the things I print out there, someone will send a text back to me, and I have to withdraw the picture right away because they go like, that's not really true. Okay, there was one where they found the wheels and everything across the, uh, uh, where, the, where, the, where the Egyptians were crossing the Red Sea, and they found the tracks, and they found all these wheels down there and everything, and, and you know, where the water was full of them, and, uh, and we're like, wow, I, I put that one up, I thought, this is a good one, and then I got a, a text that said, mm, you might want to look into that one, it wasn't true. <laughs> you know, now they have, I believe, found the ark, that's different, but you know, some of these things, so anyways, I told this to my congregation, and only to find out sometime later that a friend of ours shared with us how, how McDonald's was, it was helping some ministries, but they would not say, they would do it uh, uh, secretly because they said, we've got this stupid thing that we're part of the Church of Satan out there, and we don't want them to look like a fight, but that's not, and, well, then I was so relieved, I could go to McDonald's. And then I was sweating because now I have to come to my congregation and say, you know, like, remember what I said and it's really true and everything. I think we just, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I got excited. So I said that and hopefully uh, they, 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 they grasped it. So, so here we see all these things uh, that are on the market and, uh, and, and uh, we get so worked up about it. 
But I think the story that we're looking at today might have had an earlier version of the uh, uh, Houston, we are in and we have a problem. So I'm going to follow up the, the Houston story in a, in a few moments. You'll see what I'm talking about. But what we've been looking at in, in Acts, we found Paul who was warned not to go to Jerusalem. He was warned not to go to Jerusalem in, in chapter 20 and 21. They warned him not to go to Jerusalem. They said chairs and suffering was waiting for him. It's interesting that people sense and pick up a word of knowledge um, and, and, and they give a, ca a caution. Um, but but uh, we find that when you, someone has a word of knowledge, the Bible gives a, num a number of, of co um, gift, the gifts that are, are done by the Holy, the Holy Spirit. And there's the pro prophecy, that we talked about prophecy, but there's also the, the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom. And so the knowledge comes here. And people picked up the knowledge, okay, and said they, they, uh, they want to save his life. So they came to, uh, to Paul and said, don't go to, to Jerusalem because it's going to be bad. And uh, we need to uh, obey you. You need to pull away from it. Don't go, to, don't, don't go there. And so they got part of that message. It was true. We find in Acts, Acts 21, verse 10. After we uh, had been there a, a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Jerusalem, from Jerusalem Judea, uh, uh, coming o over to us, and he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet, and said, the Holy Spirit says that if you weigh the hope of the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, will bind the owner of this belt, and will hand it over to the Gentiles. And when he heard this, he said, listen, he had a vision, he had a dream, he had, a, he, he had this word of knowledge, this is what's going to happen. And Paul said, when he heard, when we heard this, we and the people were pleading with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, he said, why are you weeping and breaking your, my heart? I am ready not only to go to, to be bound, but also to die in Jeru, Jeru, uh, Jeru, Jeru, uh, Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. In verse 14, Paul said, uh, when he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, Okay, Lord, your will will be done. So he would be warned, don't go there, don't go there, don't go there. They had a word of knowledge. It just became, as the people had that word of knowledge, it meant nothing without the word of wisdom, though. And we have to have the word of wisdom when we have the word of knowledge. The word of wisdom tells us, this is what you need to do. Our call and determination years ago, and I wanted to share this with you, and many of you know this, and some don't know it, but uh, when I came to Bentley, they'd been sitting there unemployed uh, without a pastor, and they tried many, many people, and we came three times from Kamloops to meet with the people in the church. Three times to preach, three times for them to look at us, meeting with all the leaders, and the final time we came, all the leaders in the church gathered together, and the church had already been split, there was over half the church Almost half the church was gone already, but there was 170 people. And all the leaders came together to meet and question and challenge me on anything and everything. And I remember the last day I came, the third year, the third time I came all the way from, from Kamloops. And we went for lunch with all the leaders out there. And their job was to challenge me if I was making mistakes. They've been hurt. They, they were upset with former leadership or whatever. And... And so their job was to really, really, and, and, I mean, you ever sit there when everybody's got you on, on the barrel and they're, and they're trying to see, if, is there any flaws, is there anything wrong in your life? So they challenged me. And one man that was part of the leadership had had surgery so he couldn't talk because I was going to have that surgery and um, they, you can't talk for a week after with uh, surgery on, on your vocal cords. I woke up after that and they're talking to me and I go like, you can't. I had letters to write and someone to preach and everything, and they said there was nothing there. <laughs> so, uh, but this guy, he wrote down and he was concerned because I think I mentioned Jimmy Swaggart in one of my messages. And so he said that, that can't be good. And he wrote that down, and that was one of the questions. And when we had the vote that night, there was a vote no. There was about one vote that was no because I mentioned Jimmy Swaggart. But you know, life has many challenges and bumps and bruises. But, you know, while we came here and, and uh, we waited for them to vote on many people before and then it was our turn. But while we came here, after the first year or so, we actually blessed 17 families with farewell gifts. 
People that just thought their time was done being in Bentley. And we blessed 17 families with, uh, with farewell gifts. A number had tried to challenge why we'd stay, showed us the way out of Bentley. Others came to try and take over. This is what we went through. Uh, but I want you to understand something here. Interesting, uh, no one tries to take over uh, Brother Osteen or Lakewood. You know, they, they don't. But they come in and look at, at the size of our church and go like, you know, and sometimes it's retired pastors or people that want to be pastors, they come in, they look around and go like, well, well I can get this one. You know, I can get this one. Or they see that God has given us favor with the people in the community and people want to use that favor. And I don't allow them to use that favor. You know, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, God has given us opportunity. So it's interesting that uh, these things have happened. But when it, uh, when it looks small, it looks like that people will, will fall for it, then people try to take it. 29 years in the calling, is, and this calling that we have here is stronger than the day we waited for them to vote on us and while others uh, were being voted on before us. They had one pastor that they voted and he lost by one vote and they never came here. And we waited, we just knew in our hearts that this is where God wanted us to be. Waited for months. God gave me another job because I quit driving truck and I drove I drove a charter bus for a while. And um, waited, waiting for my turn because I knew this is where God wanted me to be. And the, 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 the numbers came through and we came. But you see, the word of knowledge must be coupled with the word of wisdom. And if we don't have the word of wisdom, we'd be like the Gentile, like the Jews that came to Paul and said, don't go there. They had dreams, they had visions, they even give an illustration. Uh, this is what's going to happen to you. And, um, and so we need that word of, word of wisdom. And our pastor gave us both the week before we moved here. He described in a vision that what we were going to be walking into and how it would be work, how it worked out. Last year I received from another pastor friend, uh, a word from a friend, and this pastor confirmed that it was going to be a battle, that what was going to happen. And uh, then my friend that wrote me uh, a year ago said, may this be the year that your critics are forced to apologize because of the favor on your life. God's favor, not my favor. The year that your enemies decide they need to be your friends, and the season when everyone who watches your life wakes up to the fact that God is the one who has provided, fueled, strengthened, empowered through all, the, all of these years. And if God be for us, then who can be against us? That was a word from God. He gave us, he said, hang in, hang in, because people will see it. They're not bad people, but you know, we get caught up in this. This, this, this prophet came to Paul and said, listen, Paul, let me have your belt. And he thought, what's this going on? And then he wrapped up his hands and his legs and tied himself up and said, this is what's going to happen to you. So Paul was in the same boat. He comes to Jerusalem. He tries to appease the religious, self-righteous people and then pre pre uh, presumes, uh, they presumed a lie that, that you know, you, you're evil, Paul, because you brought a heathen into the temple. It was a lie. It wasn't true. And people always make up ideas. They never ask. You know how many people ever ask me what's going on? Next to none. They can tell you what's going on, but they never ask. Why did you do this? They don't ask. And then, well, I finally learned out, you, you know, some people would, might ask, or, or I'm trying to explain it to people. And I, they'd say, well, what's wrong with this and what's wrong with that? I'm trying to explain it to them and uh, why there's a conflict and what's going on. And then they go out there and say, well, don't trust him. He's going to talk about other people. You go like, oh, you can't win one way or the other. You know, like trying to explain what, you know, but God is saying, you've got to know that I've called you. You've got to know that I've called you. And they presume that, they, they presume that there, there was a lie. He hadn't brought anybody in there. And then all of a sudden there's a riot. The Romans tried to save his life. Early on, God has given us, here in Bethany, God has given us favor with the community. It's been amazing the favor that God has given us with this community um, and how the community has been there to protect us. And uh, I know people that when people are mad at us and, and are saying nasty things, people from the community are saying, leave him alone, he's our pastor. They didn't go to church here, but they were saying, leave him alone. He really does care. He's there for us. And so we see what happens is God uses different people to, to rescue us. And that's what happened in chapter 21, verse 30. It says, the whole city was aroused and the people came running from all, all directions, seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, 
news reached the commander of the Roman troops, and the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. And he took he once at, he at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. The rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, and they stopped beating Paul. Thank God that he sent somebody that wasn't a Christian or believer or what was like a community person protecting someone. The commanders came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. And then he asked who he was and what he'd done. Some of the crowd shouted one thing, some another, and since the commander uh, could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. Interesting thing, when people get ganged up, people get upset, people are hurt, people want to do something, and I've shared this with you before. I remember sitting at the home one night with two families that had chosen that it was time for them to leave Bentley Christian Center. That's what it used to be called. And they, I sat at the table in the middle, and this family was saying, we've got to leave. And they both said, there's trouble with the music. There is trouble with the music in the church. And so I said, well, what's the trouble? Well, this family said, it is just too slow and too old. And this family said, it's too too loud and too young and too and, and too uh, too fast. And they both agreed the trouble was the music. And I'm going, like, it was amazing. If you get what you want, they're leaving. If you get what you want, they're leaving. And you both think the music's the problem. Is the music the problem? No, they had a struggle in their hearts or whatever it was, and they both laughed. I think we gave them gifts, and they both laughed. But they're sure <coughs> that it was the music. And so when you see that, the people aren't, they really don't know. And that's what happened with here. They said, like, they, they said, shouted one thing, said others shouted another thing. And they, they were wondering, what in the world is going on? The commander came up and arrested him and said, we got to get to the truth. There was such an uproar. Because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken to his, into the barracks. And when Paul reached the steps, and the violence of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, get rid of him. Wow. It, he tells here of his big mistake in, pers in, in pers per persecuting believers. You see, he told him what was right. Like, he said, what do I need to talk? He said, well, what do you want to talk about? He said, well, I want to explain to you how I was part of the, the, the society, the group, the religious group that was out to destroy anybody that was believing in God. In Acts chapter um, and he said, I'm going to explain where I came from. What I did, I did was wrong. He didn't cover his faults. That's something that I've tried to do all the time I've been here. I don't cover things over weeks. I talk it out. And, uh, you know, like when, when, when people are at war, we're going to deal with them on Sunday morning. We're going to deal with what God's Word says about it. And I remember exactly, exactly uh, 29 years ago when, when we had a situation here where, uh, where I, I've shared it with you before, but it was, it was, it was just unbelievable. Uh, it was a long weekend, and uh, a whole group of people from the church left, and they went up to camp, and they had a great camp out. And I just said, decided, well, they said we could come with them, but it was 18 couples or something, families, and I said, we'll stay here and put on a turkey dinner. And that was the start of our turkey dinners. And I said, we'll just stay, because lots of people couldn't afford to go. We didn't have a camp, but we'll stay. Well, Sunday morning, a whole bunch of them showed up. They were mad as all can out, because a bunch of them that were out there were all drinking. And they wanted me to fire them because they were my teachers in the Christian school. And they, they come back and they wanted me to fire them because they were drinking. And that week, well, I'll tell you, all the hell broke loose. Um, the, the ones that were drinking were upset, saying, like, there's no difference between drinking and overeating. They were eating, oh, gluttony and drunkenness, and they're no different. And the other group saying, they can't be teachers. And I'm going, like, okay, we need to deal with this. We need to deal with this. I listen to them all, and I give you a word. And the word was simply that... Uh, that we're not to judge one another, new, new feast, fast, what we eat, what we drink, we're not to judge one another. And I said, like, like, when we judge one another, I mean, we're, we're not doing what God's called us to do. So this week, there's been a lot of judgment about those who are drinking. And then I went on to say, so the, 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 they thought they'd won, and I went on to say, now I've got to tell you the rest of the scripture out of Colossians. It says, set not your heart on the things of this world, but the things that are above, for the things of this world are temporary. And, 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 and natural, but where your heart is, there will the treasure be also. And I went on to say, um, what's happened is, is there's been a big discussion over whether we can drink or not. It says not whether you can drink or not. That is ir irrelevant. That is not the point. The issue that is that two groups are fighting over it. The one group is saying we're right, the other group is saying we're right, 
And I said, really, the problem is, I, I, I made up, and I shared this with you, I made up some, I had some fictitious illustrations. I said, I said, uh, you know, like, um, yeah, there's no difference between eating and drinking or reading. But I said, let me just give you some uh, headlines. A man eats three Big Macs and loses control of his car and kills the family of four. And I went through some of the things that help those cause. And I said, it's not that whether you can drink or not. The issue is, well, I said, let me ask you this question. I pointed to the wall. I said, if you told me that girl there's nobody there is ugly, I'd say, so? And I said, but if you say my wife is ugly, I'd go, you want a knuckle fist? What's the difference? It's where I set my heart. My heart is in my wife. I'll defend her. So where do we set our heart? On our righteousness or on our ability to drink? Our heart's supposed to be set on the Lord. It's not whether we can drink or not. It's what we, where we set our heart and we're willing to fight. So I don't think I won with either group. <laughs> it was all over. But the word of God came up. And so we specifically went through what does God's word say about this? God's word says, quit judging. Quit picking at one another, love one another. I'm still preaching the same message today. You see, everyone has different different uh, standards or different traditions and things, and we gotta quit judging them. Uh, you know, it used to be over hair, long hair, uh, short hair. You know, uh, I told you before when I went to get ordained, I was told that I needed to shave my beard because it wasn't becoming for have a beard and be reverend. And a couple of the leaders said. They got ticked off about it and said, you know, like, I, I grew a beard because I used to have marks and things like that, some scars. And uh, so I just grew a beard and then people thought I was older. And uh, so I just said, I don't think it's right to take it off just for one day because someone thinks I should take it off. That's hypocrisy. So I kept my beard and I did get a rain. And, uh, but, the, but the issue was that it, it wasn't the beard. And, and, and one guy said, I bet you're the first person in the last 40 years that got her name with a beard. And I laughed being, you know, like I am. I said, yeah, and before that, they all had them. You know, like, it's tradition. We get locked up. And so here he's saying, okay, this is the problem. You know, Paul told it exactly like it was in verse 27, in 22, chapter 22, verse 17. And when I returned to Jerusalem, he said, I was praying at the temple. I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speak to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of the martyr Stephen was shed, I was stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who killed him. Then the Lord said unto me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Wow. Let's continue on with what it says there. He said, He's going to send you far away to the Gentiles. Chapter 22, verse 22. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this, and then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him! He's not fit to live! Why? Because God's sending him to the Gentiles? Great church, folks. Uh, he didn't fit their religious rituals. He said, Get rid of him! He's not worthy to live! Matthew 15 and, and 16 says, uh, Jesus quoted Isaiah 29, 30, 13, and says, And the Lord said, Because this people draws near with their words, and honors me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me. And it's their reverence for me consists of traditions learned by rote. They're just doing traditions. So we look as we continue on in, in Acts, it says in verse 23, people will get locked up in this, and it's not what God wants. And as they were shouting and throwing their cloaks and flinging dust in the air, they were a nice church bunch. <laughs> uh, you call holy rollers bad, and these guys were nuts. They're throwing dust in the air and their coats. And the commander ordered that Paul be taken to the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. Houston? We have a problem here. Houston, we have a problem here. What are we going to do, he said. I put that in. What are we going to do? I think he had that feeling before, long, before they did in Houston. What are we going to do, he asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and said, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. And Paul says, I was born a citizen, Paul replied. It's interesting how things... That get, when things get out of control, the things that may have been seen as a problem become the solution. 
Things done long before and forgotten. Think of Joseph, locked up, sent, beat up, tossed away, sold into slavery, into prison. Um, seemed like a big problem, but it was the solution. Things done long before and forgotten. Mordecai saved the king's life, Nebuchadnezzar's life, and uh, but it was it was all forgotten. They they never awarded him until the day that Haman came. Right on the, on the moment he came in to ask if he could have a, a gallows, and he built 75 good gallows to kill Mordecai. And, and he walks in before the king, who read the, couldn't sleep, so that was part of it. And the, the servant read the, the history and said, what have we done for this man? What have we done to honor him? He saved my life. And he said, nothing. And Haman walks in and he says, what would, should I do to honor someone that's really special, that's done something special? Haman's going like he's talking about me. What would I like? I want the king's royal garment. I want to pray. I want to be the front of it. And I want to, I want to be recognized as the most important person in, in Babylon. And the king says, that sounds good. Go do it for Mordecai. Well, Mordecai, he was coming to ask if he could kill Mordecai. Well, he wouldn't even admit how bitter he was. He went home and said, my life is at an end. He's, and he went up, but he went up and did it because he was still trying to win, win Haman over, or um, Nebuchadnezzar over. And so you see, there are, the other day I got a reminder. There was a, a thing from the, I don't know if it was Credit Union Bank, and it said, uh, it was called uh, Pay Yourself First. Pay Yourself First. Just if you got a little extra money there, put it into a little savings. And I thought, that reminds me of how God works. Years ago, when we moved from Dauphin to, you know, to, to Merritt, uh, we you know, shut everything down and we did everything. And then we were there for a year and a half and then we were let go from the church and we sat to sit and trust God for a year. For unemployment was like 22%, the interest rates were about the same. It was, and I can work, with, I can always, I can do so many different jobs. I would never be stuck, but I wasn't allowed to at that point. And uh, so every month we had to trust God because I got unemployment was so 600 and our rent was 650 or maybe it was 650 or not 650 was a rent. And uh, by the way, I mentioned about the taxes here. Uh, it's, it seems like lots, 5,000, so it's 400 and some a month. But if, if the church had to pay me a housing allowance to rent a house, we wouldn't be looking at 450 a month. We'd be looking at about $1,700 a month. So it really does save the church to, to keep the house. It, it saves the church money. Um, so we see that, anyways, so I was, this one month we were going to uh, visit in Saskatchewan, and every month we had to wait for the money to come in and how God would provide. And that month we needed to pay it ahead, because we were going to be gone when it was payday for the rent. And uh, about two days before we ran, the rent was due and we had to leave, I got a letter in the mail from the Scotia Bank in Dauphin, just reminding me of my savings account. And I had $750, $45 in my savings account. I didn't know I had a savings account yet. <laughs> uh, the reason was, not because I'm that terrible, but, but I had gone to the bank one day and this lady had said to me, some of you know the story, the lady said to me, Pastor Greg, she said, you know, there's a contest here. I'm trying try to get people to sign up for this contest. It's called Pay Yourself First. Well, I'm doing it again. She said, I get some points, I can win a prize if, if, if I can book people. She said, just go, what happens is, if you got $50 in your bank at the end of the month that you don't need, they'll just take it over and put it in your savings. If you need it, they won't take it. And you can get it whenever you want. She said, you can quit after I win. And so I said, well, being a kind of guy, I like to help everybody. I said, well, I can do that. I'm not going to hurt. So I forgot all about it. And every month was there. And years later, I know merit needing money. The Lord knew I had money in my account. I didn't deal with that bank anymore. And they sent me a letter and I go, what? Wow. You see, sometimes God, well not sometimes, all the time, God, God sets things in order. When we're walking and being seen, and you'll see the things come up down the road. Um, you find that uh, when we look at this, we see that uh, in, in the whole story there, God knew that God had a plan to thwart the schemes of Satan, and Jesus dying on the cross was a plan to seal the death to all mankind having to die. One would die that all would be able to live. And he offered the iniquity, uh, he was offered for our iniquity, um, but you know, the enemy offered him to, to take his own power, which is iniquity, taking the power that isn't ours. Feed, feed yourself, you're hungry, 40 days, feed yourself. He wouldn't take it. Protect yourself. You know, uh, you can fall down from here, but the angels will protect you. Honor yourself, I'll give you everything, but he wouldn't do it. 
Because God said no. The, the, the plan was he's going to die on the cross. The devil didn't know that was the plan. Or he wouldn't have done it. Verse 29 says, uh, those who were about to interrogate him, you see Houston, we've got a problem, said they were about to beat him and abuse him. Uh, they withdrew immediately. And then the commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. Yes, Houston, we do have a problem. Verse 30, it says, the commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews. So the next day he released them and ordered the chief priests and all the members of the Sanhedrin to assemble. And then he brought Paul in and had him stand before him. And we'll hear the rest of it next, not next week, the week after. What actually happened then? Come back in two weeks and we'll have, because next week we're going to be having a service in the park. The message is, remain faithful no matter the cost. Religious people are caught up in in uh, not caught up in sin, but in, in iniquity. And it says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, Beware of false prophets, which will come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are raving wolves. They will know, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes, or thorns, or figs, or thistles? Uh, even so, good, a good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. If there's corruption in people's lives, it's a corrupt tree. There's corruption in there. Uh, it, it comes forth the fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. And uh, every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruit you shall know them. And then he says in verse 21 of Matthew 15, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have we cast out devils, in thy name have done many wonderful works, and then he, I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. They're actually workers of iniquity. Iniquity is choosing to be a God yourself, choosing to do your own way. So what I'm saying today is, Houston, we have a problem. We do have a problem in our churches today. Broken relationships, divided bodies, the nastiness that abounds, trying to defend the gospel, not trying to defend the gospel, we don't have to form 42,000 denominations to protect what we feel is the gospel. We need to love one another. I want to close with the prayer of Jesus prayed. I mentioned it often. I'm just going to read it to close. Uh, we call it the, 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 the Lord's Prayer. We, we, the prayer we prayed this morning is a disciple's prayer the Lord gave us. But this is Jesus' prayer. John chapter 17. I'm going to read this in closing. These words spoke Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, this was just before he was crucified. The hour is come. Glorify thy Son, as thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to those, to as many as he has, thou hast given him. And this is the life eternal, that they might know thee, and the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. How I have glorified thee on earth, and I have finished the work which thou gave me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, and with the glory which I have with thee before the world was. He, he shared that glory now saying, Now, Father, I have worked it through. I'm about to die. It's time. He says in verse 6, I have manifested thy, thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou hast given, gavest them to me, and they have kept my, thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou givest to me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me, send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. For they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in thee, in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I will come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given to me, that they might be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in their in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Verse 13, And now I come unto thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have joy fulfilled in themselves, and I have given them thy word. And the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And that's what we see today. The Bible, you see that article I put in there, the, 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 the ISIS guy is killing a, a priest. 
in the altar and making him kneel down before the altar and slicing his throat. Uh, he's 80 some years old. I mean, it's symbolical. The evil of ISIS, the evil of the Muslim teachings is against Christianity. It's out to do in Judaism and Christianity. And this way said, the world will hate them. I pray not that thou take care of them, take them out of the world, but that thou should keep them in, from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified through truth. Neither pray I, verse 20, uh, for those alone, but for also the also which shall believe on me through their word, which is us. That they might be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I am in thee. That they may also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou hast gave, gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Verse 23, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and thou hast loved them, and hast loved me. Father, I will, I will that thou also, whom thou givest me, be with me where I am, that they may behold thy glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundations of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. Excuse me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the world, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. That's Jesus' prayer, that we be one. God help our Christian church to come together. God help us to support one another. To see this week, we saw people from different churches all here working together for children in this community. We have the German church is all set up for lunch. They're all having water baptismal service, and then they'll be here. That we be one. That we start sharing. We're not competing. We're here to love one another. That was Jesus' prayer. And I've said it, I say it again. If anybody's prayer should get answered, it should be his. And I don't know what it's going to take. Because I'm telling you, the fighting that's going on and political fighting and the stuff that's going on is unbelievable. It's going to make you sick before it's all over. We need to go to prayer. Go to the Word of God. Pray for our leaders. Pray for those in authority over us. Pray for one another. Pray for our community. Pray for the future of our community. Pray for one another. If one, the Bible says if one member suffers, we all suffer. So if you see somebody going through something, we pray. So that's what we did today for Michelle. We continue to pray one for another that God will be glorified and he promised he will. Father, we thank you today. Lord, Houston, there is a problem. And Lord, we can say that for the church today. There is a problem. Man has got so caught up with themselves and, and, and involved in their own iniquity, trying to be gods themselves and trying to have it their way and get what they want. But Father, you said you sent Jesus into the world. And the very last thing he did uh, before his death was he got down and washed the disciples' feet. They were arguing over who's going to be the greatest and who could be next to Jesus in heaven. And, and you're talking about dying and they're worried about who's going to have the authority with them. And, and you said, you must become a servant. And you, and you demonstrated by washing their feet. The least will be the greatest and the greatest will be the least. So Father, open our word, your word to our hearts. Maybe you see this. Houston, there is a problem, but God, we thank you that you're bigger than, than you're even bigger than Houston that can solve the problem. Lord, we can come to you, cast the whole of our care upon you. For you care for us. Bless us now, we pray. Teach us, Lord. Show us the relationships we need to make right. Things and wrongs that have been made wrong, and we need to make them right. We've made, taken stands like I shared at McDonald's, and, and it wasn't right, and I had to make it right. So, Father, I just pray that as people listen to this, that, Lord, you'll touch our hearts. Let us know if there's situations we need to make right. Father, it's about being in a relationship, being in one. Not being right, but being one in you. That the world will know that you came into this world. Father, we thank you for this now in Jesus' name. Amen.